a matter of fact, the, the two big helpers in this were actually Kitsy and Chris, and I'll tell you why. Is uh, we were out on, um, if you remember Wednesday, just a small aside, it was hotter than all get out. We almost killed Chris <laughs> on our prayer walk. But um, I, I was out and I was telling Chris and kids who were walking on this prayer walk, I said, here's, here's the quote, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And I said, just ask him, I said, what does that mean to you? What, what do you gain from that phrase? Uh, what's it all about? <clears throat> and uh, they shared some great insights. And the reason is it sounds okay. There's one of those things that Jesus said. But here's the thing about this little quote is that it happens across all the Gospels. It refers to something that is unbelievably deep in the Old Testament, and it's so deep that this evening is really where we get it. It's just incredible how deep this, uh, this rabbit hole goes on that uh, saying. But I asked them, uh, because it seemed to me if, you know, Scripture works this way. We all know this is, a, is that if it repeats itself, you pay attention. And if it repeats itself in both Testaments, you really pay attention. So if it's all of this repetition, there must be something in there that is more than just telling us a little bit about Jesus. There is something foundational that if, if you and I don't get it, we're going to miss something we need for the spiritual walk that we're trying to, to um, follow, this walk that we're on. So I was digging in this, and uh, a number of things come up. And as I, I was looking into it, I said, okay, well, let's just, as we get into this on Sunday, let's just follow a real basic strategy here. W what we're going to do is let's take the biblical scene where we find the phrase, get the backstory, I mean the real backstory on when Jesus was there, what was going on, what were they saying, what was the whole thing, take a balanced observation of that, and then see how we can apply it. Now, when it comes to meaning, the only meaning that is real is what you take and apply once you leave this place. If it doesn't get there, it doesn't matter what it said. It doesn't matter how true it is, because then there'll be nothing done with it. But let's start with the backstory. What's going on here? Well, as we look into the story where I find, and you find Jesus saying this thing, it's across the Gospels, like I said. So there's some condensed versions, and then there's some expanded versions. So you got like the Twitter version, you know, if you get on your phone, you get the little Twitter news. And then you've got the expanded thing, like if you get a big newspaper or something, a big article. So we're going to start with the Twitter version. And we're in Mark 6, you've already heard it, beautifully succinct bit of uh, passage. Chris has already read it, so I'm just going to hit some of the operative phrases you see uh, outlined there in your, in your guide sheet. Came home, we know that. His disciples followed him, we know that. He's teaching in the synagogue as his routine, so we know that. Um, we know that they're astounded by what they hear. We know that they're astounded by works that were being done by his hands. We know that they refer to him as a ca uh, carpenter, and they talk about his family a little. We know that despite all this other stuff, they take offense. We know that Jesus then gives that phrase that's key to the whole thing. We were talking about a prophet without honor except in his hometown. And then we know that he could not do mighty works there, or not many. He healed a few sick. And we know that he marveled because of their unbelief, and we know that he continued among the village's teaching. So let's start picking it apart a little bit. Let's just think of where we are in this. We're getting at the beginning of Christ's ministry, so things are just gaining traction. There was Jesus, the skilled uh, workman, for 30 years, and now uh, there's this recreation in the public eye anyway, 
of this whole new image, this whole new persona going on. We know that uh, he was born in Nazareth, so he was born up in kind of the highland country, and Capernaum was a bustling town. It made sense. It's a, uh, if you were to go there today, it would be a 54-minute car ride or so. You'd take his, uh, the Israeli Route 65 to get there, probably a steep drive down some uh, 33 and a half miles. Now, if you're walking, uh, there is a steep trail. It's probably, you know, 10, a 10 hour walk in one direction, but going uphill is probably more like 20. So he moved away from town a good distance, moved to more of a bustling town. It would make sense if he was a skilled laborer, there'd be more work there. So that's what he did, but now he's coming back to his hometown. But he's coming back in a different persona, a whole different thing. He, it says he's coming with disciples. Well, that's the protocol. That lets you know right there. He's coming back as a rabbi. Only spiritual teachers had disciples. So here's Jesus with his interns. Here's Rabbi Jesus type thing coming back. There's talk about him healing people, only prophets do that. So he's coming back in this official capacity as a, a rabbi and as a prophet. These are some pretty heady things. Now, Jesus, when you go to your hometown, ever go back if you, if you don't live in your hometown, you go back, and no matter what you do or, do, or what you uh, are known for, when you go back, it's the, uh, oh yeah, I knew you went. It's that type of thing. They knew you when you were the little kid or the little troublemaker or whatever you were back in those times. Uh, it made me think of a, of a Glenn Campbell song from 1973 when he put this out. Anyone remember uh, Glenn Campbell's song, I Knew Jesus Before He Was a Superstar? Yeah, and that is it. Uh, can you sing us a few lines, Pam? Or no, okay. <laughs> But uh, Glenn Campbell really uh, gained some traction with that. It was the whole I knew you when thing going on there. And here's a, a town full of family, friends, relatives, and they knew him when. They knew him before all of this stuff. And so there's the scenario. He goes to teach in the synagogue. Now, right now, we're in a pretty rough situation because we're in ancient Israel and Positions and niches in life are pretty well fixed. You were born into what you were born into. Jesus was born into a skilled labor family. That was his thing. That's what he did. And now here he's coming back claiming to be a rabbi. That's a little hard to swallow because they knew him when. And the fact that he's coming back also as a, a prophet, well, now we're really kind of getting out there. But they make that statement, isn't this the carpenter? And carpenter is kind of a rough translation. It was more like a worker of wood. Somebody, the, the person we call a carpenter in our language, the worker of wood, he might come and build you a chicken coop, or he might come and put a cabinet in your house, or he might build a table. He was more, the word handyman would probably fit better. Uh, a handyman. Then the crowd, uh, they, they start mentioning his siblings by name. They start mentioning all of these brothers and sisters. And the thing we notice is all the names are common. Even Jesus is a very common name. Isn't this the handyman from this common family? So in effect, I want you to get the picture here. Here is this synagogue with this religious meeting going on and all these people who knew him when sitting there and he's getting up to, to teach spiritually and, and even as they're marveled by some of the things in effect they're like isn't that Billy Bob the handyman you know it's a very common it, isn't it and, and now he's up here doing this stuff it says they were astonished now astonished in the positive sense in the root of the Greek it means like somebody being struck in the stomach and expelling air so you get the idea to be to be astonished would mean you hear something and you go oh, that's what it is you know so Jesus was teaching and they were sitting there and they were hearing this stuff and they were going oh, 
You can translate that. That's exactly it. It's if you look back, what do you know from Scripture? I know this. Because <gasps> that's what they did. They were astonished. So, and then it goes on to say why they were astonished. Let me ask you, when's the last time you heard something in, in, in a teaching, in anything, uh, that it left you not in a negative but a positive way going, oh, you know, you know, how many times does that happen in church, you know? Maybe not all that often, but the fact is, as he was teaching, however he was putting things, whatever he was saying, it says they gasped. They were astonished at the depth of the truth they were hearing. Never heard it put that way before. They were astonished at the wisdom from which he was speaking. Never heard that depth before. And then it says they were also astonished by the abilities uh, and the works of his hands. I love the Greek, the way they kind of nuance it. It says the, ability, the abilities through his hands that are becoming. It just puts a whole flavor to that. It's that. Jesus just didn't heal people. When he touched people, they became something. They became healed. They became not blind. They became something. That's what was going on. So all this fantastic stuff is going on. It's so fantastic that everybody is going, oh, I'm going to get the hyper <laughs> hypoxia or whatever before I'm done with that one. But here they are, they're astonished, and yet what's their response? The response is more, I knew Jesus before he was a superstar. Their response was, isn't that Billy Bob the handyman? They couldn't get beyond that. And then we have these lines that uh, if we link them together wrong, we might get the wrong impression. There are two lines. It says, he could not do many mighty works. He could not do it. As a matter of fact, it says he could do no mighty work, which really meant even though he was doing some mighty things, it wasn't enough to make a big impression on the region. And then it says he marveled and uh, he marveled at their unbelief. And that's dumbfounded, to, be, to marvel, to kind of give you the idea. I just, I, I just kind of, this scenario struck me. I read this little anecdote one time about this high school professor. And he's teaching his class about the First World War. And he has original footage from the war. And you know how that works. We've all seen that that footage from back in the 1920s and people look like they're doing this and it's all in black and white and scratchy. So, but anyway, it was original footage. So he's showing this to his students and when he's done this, this wonderful footage and, and he says to his, uh, asked his, his students, he said, so anyone got any questions about what you just saw? And some young lady pops, pipes up from the back and she says, why did they make it in, over in that bad black and white? <laughs> Kid from the digital age, right? And so the teacher just said, he concludes his article, he said, I had no words. <laughs> A remark like that, I had no words. And that's kind of where Jesus was when it says he marveled. He, he did all these things. He, he showed them, he spoken as clearly as you possible could, possibly could, and there they are still stuck on, isn't that Billy Bob the handyman? He said, I have no words. You know, he marveled at their unbelief. But here's the thing to be careful about this, is what does it mean that he could not do works because of they had no faith? Does your faith heal you? Like, if you're sitting there and you have something wrong with you and you come to a healing time, we have them all the time, and you don't get healed, is that, well, your faith was just not strong enough. Your faith just wasn't pure enough, so you weren't healed. No, that's, that's kind of really getting a wrong deduction. The point is more like this. Here is someone they understood in one small little capacity. They still were hung up on Billy Bob the handyman. Even though this fellow shows up and shows mighty works of God's grace, they don't even approach him because, well, he's just Billy Bob the handyman. 
He's not really all that big. He's not really all that great. Yeah, we knew him back when. Wow. And keep in mind, we're talking church people here. They refuse to see him as anything else but that limited view. They were convinced they already knew who he was. Gee, I'm glad we're not like that in church, that we're not so dogmatic that we actually think we know who Jesus really is completely, huh? But they thought they did, and it crippled them. There was a lot of people who were literally physically crippled because of that. And so Jesus, even though he could do mighty things, did not do mighty things because, as in we talked in the first service, the free will of the, the people involved in this decided that he's just Billy Bob and we won't go to him in the first place. Man, how we can cripple ourselves just by taking a small view of God. But that's what they did. And then the, the, the whole story concludes with something that you'd almost miss it if you weren't paying attention. It just ends with this little line. And he went up, uh, about among the villages teaching. He, all this stuff was going on. You had him show up and do all this stuff. He's rudely dismissed on, on who he is. They're rejecting him left and right. Uh, they are being unfaithful, but even as he stays faithful. Even though all of this is going on, he went among the villages and taught. He stayed to the task despite it all. Gee, maybe there's a lesson in there for us too, isn't there, after all? So by the end of this, we find this out. As, as, I, as I was getting all these insights and, and uh, as uh, uh, people were sharing with me, I still felt I was missing something in all of this. And what I was missing was this, is that there are two places in this scenario that I was talking about. At any given time, you might be sitting out there as a church person in our synagogue, and you could be in the place of Christ, or you could be in the place of those rejecting him. We'll get talking about that a little more. But sometimes it is that we're rejecting God and he's saving us despite who we are, are not because of who we are. Anyway, here we are and we're, we've talked about this. We've taken the Twitter view. Now, if we were going to look for an expanded view just to try and fill in a few of the pieces like well, what exactly did he say? What exactly was he referring to in this? What exactly was their response? We probably go to Luke. Luke's the expanded version in Luke uh, chapter 4. And, and Luke uses stronger language uh, than Mark does. And in Luke 4, 17, it says, And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. Okay. Here is this Billy Bob, the handyman, show up claiming to be a rabbi, and he asked for the scroll of Isaiah. That's some really heavy-hitting stuff. Right there, they knew they were in to something pretty deep. There's some big claims in Isaiah. And so as he goes into the scroll, he starts in Isaiah... Um, Actually, it would be uh, uh, further down in the scroll, but in verse 18, we read uh, what he is reading here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me. I want you to stop and think about that for a moment. Billy Bob, the handyman who showed up is a rabbi who is also claiming to be a prophet, has just read one of the anchor messianic texts. What does it mean to be the Messiah? It, it translates anointed one. For someone to stand up and just start reading, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, could get into some really serious claims. But that's what he does. And then he goes on to read further in what would Isaiah would have been saying. Uh, in the purpose of the Messiah, and in the 1819, he, he continues to proclaim good news to the poor. So in the New Testament, good news is actually what word? Good news is gospel, isn't it? 
That's what gospel means, is good news. So he came to proclaim the gospel to the, to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor. Lord's favor. Grace is defined as unmerited favor. And in context of the New Testament, of course, it is God's unmerited favor. So it is being the grace of God in human form. So here he is, he's claiming that hinting so far that he is the Messiah, reading then the purpose of why the Messiah here, and the people have their own vision of this, and he's telling them by reminding them of Isaiah that he's not there to kick out Rome. That's what they were hoping. He's not there to be the military leader. He's there to proclaim the gospel, and as we'll go in more this evening, to free captives, both spiritual and physical, to give sight, both spiritual and physical, and to be the grace of God. So more than a rabbi, more than a prophet, Messiah himself. And then he does. It says all the eyes were fixed on him. You bet they were fixed on him. Okay, is he going to drop the shoe? Is he actually going to come out and say it? And as he's sitting down, he's saying, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's another way of saying, here it is. Amazing. It could be um, exciting if you believed it, but from where they were, they started with Billy Bob the handyman walking up to the front of the church and ending with this guy actually claiming to be the Messiah. And it even it just keeps going from there. The, in, the insanity, as far as they're concerned, hasn't stopped. It continues on. He says, a prophet is without honor uh, in his own uh, hometown. And that directly relates to a whole bunch of prophets. Uh, he's tying in a bunch of things. Isaiah whom he is quoting. They claim to be wonderful fans and followers of Isaiah. However, how did Isaiah end his life? He was sawed in two by his own people because they didn't like his prophecy. It relates to Jeremiah, who was warned that his own family was going to try and kill him and be very careful on what they said. Jeremiah 12.6, if you're wondering. And then he brings in the big rock star names. And I mean, it's like all the Jewish kids had this poster on their bedroom wall, right? There it was. He starts, he mentions Elijah and Elisha. And, and then he starts saying, reminding of some things in Scripture that they couldn't deny. Starting with this is that he says, you know, in the time of Elijah, there were a lot of widows and now widows would, you know, symbolize people who were really in rough shape in the culture. There were a lot of them in Israel, but yet Elijah was only sent to a pagan foreigner. And then he mentions Elisha and he says, you know, there were a lot of lepers in his time in Israel, but God only sent him to Naaman, a foreigner, a pagan. What he was saying was basically this. Don't think that God has sent the Messiah here and the purpose is to take care of your own little thing going on here in Israel. As a matter of fact, in the past, because of your unfaithfulness, God has taken that blessing and spread it out to the nations of the world. And that's what's going on. Well, this is too much. Not only is he the rabbi, not only is the prophet, not only is the Messiah, he's not even there to do what they want him to do. Too much to take. Too much to take. And so they say they, they took him to the cliff, they want to throw him down. So Mark says they rejected him, but no, they wanted to kill him. They were, they were out for blood by this time. Quite a story going on. Luke saying, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. Mark says a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his household. Incredibly powerful statements drawn from the prophets. Incredibly timeless. Well, there's the backstory. So we understand a little bit of how that fits with the time of Jesus. And that's the important thing. Like, don't even try 
and draw some observation or conclusion until you really know what's going on. That's like walking into somebody else's conversation and shooting off your mouth before you really know what they're even talking about. We need to understand first. So we, we've gained some understanding in this. And so then this tied together some insightful answers. But before uh, I, I feel, uh, hit that with the missing part, let me share some things with you. Just shotgunning some texts. It deals with us. It deals with who we are in the crowd. Romans 3, 9 through 12 says, For we have already charged that all both Jews and Greeks are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And yet on the other side, 1 Peter 2, 9, 10 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here's where I'm going with this whole thing, is that even as we talk of these two groups of people, we can be either one. Even as you're sitting here, even as you're listening to this, we could be either one. We could be in the place of the rejectors. How can you be a Jesus rejector sitting in God's house? Pretty simple. Just make up your mind. You think he, you really know who he is. And just have your impression be smaller than who he really is. There, i got to tell you, we're there in the Christian church even, we're not too far removed from, yeah, Jesus can do a, lo a lot of things, but deep down he's Billy Bob the handyman. Deep down we think, no, I've got this, but I better help God out with this strategy. Yeah, God said this, but that's not the real world. Uh, and we just find some way in which we may not do it their way. Every one of us in here have a way of diminishing who God is. Every one of us in our own style and our own way. I can give you a couple of just basic examples that are uh, pretty common is people who, who, who have a belief in God, because you know what, they went to a nice church and they met nice people, and there was somebody up front talking like they maybe knew a little bit of what they were talking about. And then somewhere along the line, the people did something that wasn't that nice. Heaven forbid they were flawed in some way. Or even, hard to believe, but even that guy up front made some real faux pas and really failed at life, maybe badly. How can I have faith anymore. I'm just going to give up because those people failed so badly. Bottom line, if we're in a position, just, just a hint for you out there, if your faith, the vine that feeds your faith, the core of it comes from other people and what they do, yeah, you can gain strength and, and encouragement from fellowship this is supposed to be. But if the core of your faith comes from anything else than Christ only, you're in danger of shipwreck. You're in danger of falling into, the, uh, into this uh, uh, rejecting crowd. Another way it happens is preferences. Boy, I'm glad that Christians in the Western church don't have preferences for God. Well, if God's like that, I'm not going to believe in him. Uh, I don't think God's like that because I don't like that way. And we come up with our own preferences. That doesn't make sense to me, so God can't be that way. You know, that, that's kind of the, the only illustration I can pull to us when we fall into this preference thing is like having a preference for the sun in the sky. Is that, you know, the sun is a nice thing. I like the light, but sunburns are bad. So I'm not going to believe in the sun anymore because it gives sunburns. Well, I got news for you when you go out. Reality will catch you. The same with God. We don't tell God who he is. We just learn who he is. 
and we get in sync with that. There's just ways we can end up in this rejection place. We're in a place whenever we get into that situation. So on one hand, we can be that way. And on the other hand, we can be on the other side uh, of the situation where uh, we are called to be Jesus. So, uh, and the place, that's where we should be. Now, you can't be Jesus to the world in yourself. But you can be if you're empowered by him. If you're following and understanding him for who he says he is. If we're there, and it can be a tough place, we can learn what Jesus means by there is no honor in your own household, even as a believer. Just ask anyone who was one way, and somewhere in life they went through conversion, and then they go back home and visit the family. Anybody in that situation ever meet your brothers and sisters and they find out you've got a new faith? <laughs> I say, who do you think you are? I know you. I knew you when you were Billy Bob the handyman. And boy, do you have work on your hands to prove uh, or to at least witness to the, to the Christ reflection you're now called to do. So as we were talking back and forth, it's... Uh, it's just, I'm going to keep a book of kitsy lines. There's a couple of them that are really good. And, and, and as we were talking about this, the line she said was simply this, there, uh, to the effect of there's friction long after conversion. There's friction long after conversion. And anybody who's been through that knows, knows exactly what she meant by that little phrase. Well, so there, kitsy gave me the phrase, and I said, okay. Chris, now you're going to put a human face to it. <laughs> so Chris gets to explain w what that means. So I'm going to turn, so it gets on the camera. I'm going to turn this mic over to Chris, and I'm going to ask him to put a human face on what it means to be in this place as opposed to the other. Uh, thank you, Pastor. That's, that's an amazing message and a, and a really deep reading of this passage that I think a lot of us might just breeze through without giving a lot of thought to. Uh, and so I was really grateful when Pastor Kevin gave me the opportunity to get up and share my story about this. And before I do, I would like you to take your Next Step cards out, please. Uh, on your Next Step cards, you'll see that the challenge is we can live in any one of these two places at any given time, uh, in the place of the rejectors or in the place of Jesus Christ. And I want you to think about times when you're in both of those places in your life as I give my personal testimony. So first of all, uh, most of you have heard this, and so I'm just going to summarize it really quickly. My conversion experience was an extreme conversion experience. I was a metaphysical naturalist up until 2013. I was trained in physics, I was trained in mathematics, chemistry, and biology, and I had no use for God in my life. In fact, I had completely rejected the concept of supernatural interaction in our universe and believed that everything that happened in our universe was a natural cause of the Big Bang, if you will. In 2013, I had an illness that required that I be put into a medically induced coma in order for my body to recover from it. And at that time, God the Father gave a vision to me. Using my limited knowledge of his creation, he had the grace to give me the vision of just how complex everything in nature is, how much it demanded a designer, how much it needed a creator. And when I came out of that, I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that there was a creator of our universe. And it shook my basic understanding to the core. And I wasn't quite sure what to do with that because I had been raised in the Catholic Church and so I had already rejected Christianity. But after a few months, my wife had convinced me to talk to my uncle who was a born-again Christian and a theoretical physicist. And he went through the Bible and gave me an apologetic and showed me every place in the Bible where you can think about the scientific paradigm of our natural world in a biblical worldview, and it still makes sense. You don't have to reject science in order to accept God. And he sent me home with everything C.S. Lewis had ever written on the topic. And by the time I got through reading that, 
I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And that transformed me amazingly. But, here's the thing. I was still in the place of that audience member in that synagogue. And let me tell you why. Because I thought I had been saved by an argument. I thought I had an understanding of Jesus Christ. I knew who he was. And so if I could just take this understanding and that argument to people in my workplace, to colleagues, to other family members, I could convince them who Jesus was, give them the argument, and they would be saved. But you see, the problem with that, and that was a spectacular failure, by the way. I mean, that was truly a spectacular failure. And what I learned was the difference between myself and them at that time is that God the Father has slain me so that I could see the wisdom of what it was that he had given to me through his son, Jesus Christ. But he had not slain those I was speaking to, and so they could not see it. And so I was unaware of the power of the transformation of Jesus Christ, and I was trying to forcibly shoehorn an understanding of God's wisdom into the lives of those who had not been transformed by him. And so like that audience member, I made Jesus Christ into this tiny thing. I thought I understood who he was, where he was coming from. I knew enough about Jesus Christ to speak that knowledge into other people's lives and expect that to have the same effect. There is a place in my life where I have been called to be like Jesus Christ. And because of the choices of my past, I have found that to be very difficult. And that place is in my son's life. I raised my son for 17 years without Jesus Christ in my life and therefore without Jesus Christ in his. And so when I finally was saved, when I finally did come to Christ... I couldn't speak it into his life because he looked at me and saw who I was, not who I am today. And so in that situation, I did not have the respect and honor in my home of someone who could speak Jesus into his life. And so I continually, every day, pray that someone else will enter into his life who can speak into it. But I would just like all of you to think for a moment before you fill these cards out. Where in your life Have you made God too small? And where in your life when you preach to others has your transformation in God been made too small? And pray for those times and pray for those moments and understand, but also understand that Jesus Christ who was rejected in his hometown did what we're all called to do and that is he still went out and he still taught and he preached in the villages because he did what was commanded of him because he knew that only a few would be saved, but that was worth it. It's not about how many people reject his word, it's about the one or two that accept it that makes our call to go out into the world making disciples of nations, teaching them all that he commanded and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that makes a difference. Even if it's only one that makes our call worthwhile. Tonight at 6.30, we're going to be diving a little deeper into this, and believe me when I tell you, Isaiah may be one of the deepest minds for truth in the Bible, and so tonight, Pastor Kevin is going to be going through that passage that Jesus Christ read, and we're going to be digging out all of the truth that, that is uncovered.